So for a few minutes, we're going to do a muscle review. Remember to do what your teacher wants you to do in their lab to master the content. That's what's the most important right now is getting a good grade. A plus 100, that's what we're going for right now. I want to talk about some vocabulary that has to do with the muscle system for a few minutes. Then we'll talk about some muscles and uh, then, we'll, then we'll kind of be in a good position. We will be. Brachium or brachii refers to the arm. I want you to remember that this is the arm, this is the forearm, that the thigh is your upper part of your leg and this is your leg down here at the bottom. That kind of helps a little bit when we're talking about anatomical things. Services means neck. What does gluteal mean? Buttocks. And what does halysis mean? Your big toe. What does oculi mean? Eye, oris, <laughs> mouth, pectoralis, chest, chest polysis, thumbs. thumbs. Oblique means diagonal or across. Rectus or erect typically just means straight. That's what we think of in science. Anterior is the front, posterior is out back. If we say something is external and internal, we're saying something is outside or inside, as in exocytosis is a process that moves something where? Outside. Endocytosis would be a process moving something inside. That's really not in this chapter of material, but another way that we use EX and, and endo. Infra means below, supra means above, uh, profundus means deep, superficial means closer to the surface. Superficialis is another word that, that kind of gets used for superficial. When we talk about different muscles, there are a few prefixes that are kind of interesting. Biceps, brachii, and biceps femoris, they have two heads, two muscle heads, and that's why we say bi. We could also say di. Di means two, but not in this case. Don't substitute that at will. Quadriceps, these are the muscles on the thigh that help extend the leg at the knee, and there are four of them. Tetra is another word that we use to signify four. Triceps uh, indicates that there are three muscle bellies on the muscle that extends your forearm at the elbow. Vastus means wide. Deltoid refers to the muscle on the point of the shoulder. It is in the shape of the Greek letter delta, which is like a triangle. It is an abductor of the arms. It's an abductor of the arms. Maximus means large. Minimus means smaller. Serratus means like the edge of a knife. Serrated knife has kind of a ridgy surface to it. The origin of a muscle is typically the more fixed portion of the muscle and the insertion is usually on the part that is being moved. And the example that I like to give for the third class lever with uh, fulcrum force and load is the biceps muscle. So think with me for just a minute. If the elbow was my fulcrum, and my biceps inserts right about here and I have an apple in my hand as the load, then it's the action of the biceps that helps make this whole lever work. This is a third class lever and apparently is one of the more common lever systems in the body. So for the rest of the time, we're gonna just talk about some specific muscles of the body. This is obviously not exhaustive, but this is a I would say a generic throwdown of the muscles. So, frontalis raises the eyebrows, occipitalis helps move the hair on the head. I'm not sure why we need to be able to do that, but we have that ability. The epicraneus is the muscle occipitalis frontalis with the aponeurosis, the sheath in the middle. Everything together is called the epicraneus. Orbicularis oculi does what? What does this one do with the eye, y'all? Closes the eye. Okay. Zygomatic major, zygomaticus major, smiling muscle. Orbicularis oris is what? What do we do? Kissing. 
pissing muscle. SCM, check this out. Sternocleidomastoid flexes the head and rotates the nose to the opposite side. Platysma, what does this muscle do? This is kind of a weird muscle. It's kind of like the grimace muscle. I'm not, once again, not sure why we need to be able to do that, but we have the ability to do that. Here is a concept that's a little bit difficult for me to get in my head, so I need you to stick with me for just a minute on this. If I bring my shoulders together in the back, I'm bringing my angel bones, my scapula closer. That's called scapular retraction. That's a major function of the rhomboids, okay? But just for a second, I want you to think of the opposite of that, where the scapula would be pulled forward, as in this direction, like in a hugging action. One of the muscles that helps make that happen is the pectoralis minor. Its origin is on the coracoid process of the scapula. It inserts down onto the ribs, and it helps pull the scapula up tight against your back. The pectoralis major is on your chest. It is a flexor of the arm, an adductor of the arm. Serratus anterior is also on the side, and it's attached to your scapula. It pulls your scapula up close to your back. It's a protractor. There are intercostal muscles in between the ribs that help move your ribs. The ones that are really important for inspiration are the external intercostals and the diaphragm depressing as you breathe in, and in forced expiration, the uh, internal intercostals do that. And I think we'll see that again in just a minute. Remember that the rectus abdominis is, rectus abdominis is the straight muscle on your stomach helps to flex the trunk. There are several muscles that help compress the abdominal contents. Look up for just a second. External oblique is this direction. Internal oblique is this one. And then transversus is this way. And so you have a multiple layer holding your intestines. What happens if this intestine tries to bulge out between these muscles? What do you call that? What do you call it? I'm gonna have to have a hernia repair, right? Ever heard of that? Some people can have these in their belly button. <clears throat> sometimes they can be in the inguinal area. Sometimes they can be right through the abdominal wall. Herniation. <clears throat> the soleus and gastrocnemius muscles are the ones that help you go on your tippy toes, which by the way would be plantar flexing your feet. What is the regular word for gastrocnemius, the big muscle on the back of your leg? It's the calf muscle. Okay, thank you. By the way, we already went, did we do, no, we didn't do gluteus maximus. The largest muscle by mass in your body is the gluteus maximus, with, which helps you to extend <coughs> your thigh as you're walking. Think about the foot for just a minute. This is kind of in interesting. Let's talk about the tibialis anterior muscle on the leg. It goes down the front of the leg and then inserts on the medial aspect of the foot. So it is a dorsiflexor of the foot and an inverter. And the fibularis longus goes down the lateral aspect of the leg and it, goes, it tracks behind the ankle. And so it's a plantar flexor and an everter of the foot, fibularis longus. There are lots of other muscles in the leg on the front, on the back, there are lots of muscles on the forearm, on the front and the back, and, and, and also some in the hand, and I am just going through a general survey of these muscles, so we're not learning 20 muscles in the forearm. <clears throat> there are several muscles in the quadriceps on the front of the thigh. Those are the ones that help you extend your leg at the knee. There, immediately there's the vastus medialis, and then the vastus intermedialis, and the vastus lateralis. The vastus intermedialis, the middle one, is covered over by the rectus femoris. All four of these together make up the what? There's four of them, so they make up the what? They make up the quads, the quadriceps. There's a gracilis muscle on the inside of the thigh. It is an adductor of the thigh. The sartorius I would say it goes from the ASIS down to the medial aspect of the knee or tibia. When it contracts, it helps you to flex your leg. 
and it's also, um, I would say, an adductor of the thigh as well. And let me correct that a little bit. I said flex the leg. Let's say flex the thigh and adduct the thigh. That's a, a better way because we need to think differently between thigh and leg. Quadratus lumborum is in the low back and it's an extensor of the low back. There are little lumbricals and these are kind of cute to me. The lumbricals literally mean earthworms and they are in the middle of the bones in your hand. These long bones are called the metacarpals and they help to flex and extend your fingers. In the forearm, the palmaris longus does this action right here, flexes the hand. The extensor digitorum does this. So whenever I was trying to think about the forearm, I thought what one muscle might represent hand flexion, hand extension, palmaris longus, extensor digitorum. Remember that the brachialis is the prime mover of forearm flexion and the biceps and brachii just helps to make it happen. Kind of interesting. Triceps is what extends your arm at the elbow. It is antagonistic to the biceps and the brachialis. The deltoid is an abductor. It's an abductor of the arms. And let's go to the face again for just a minute. Masseter here and temporalis here both help to elevate the jaw and aid in chewing. If we turn around, the trapezius muscle is what helps us shrug our shoulders. And then there are some muscles on the scapula. The infraspinatus, check this out closely, helps to laterally rotate the humerus. And then the teres major, which is kind of below it in on a picture that you might look at, helps to bring the arm uh, back, it extends, adducts, and medial, medially rotates the forearm as compared to lateral rotation of the infraspinatus. The rhomboids are scapular retractors. Latissimus dorsi is needed to, to do pull downs or pull ups, however you might like to look at it. So these are extensors of the brachium and adductors, the latissimus dorsi. Gluteus medius is the abductor of the thigh and gluteus maximus is an extensor of the thigh. So when you take a step forward, the gluteus maximus on the back leg is contracting. The adductor magnus brings your leg toward the midline. That's called adduction, abduction away, adduction toward. I always remember adduction because it sounds like I'm adding something back to the midline, bringing something to the midline. On the back of the thigh are the hamstrings. The lateral muscle is the biceps femoris and then there deep is the semimembranosus and then more superficial is the semitendinosus on the medial aspect of the backside of the thigh. Also remember this, the private part in your body, those muscles that or that area is called the perineal area. And if you need to know all of the different muscles in there, there are lots of pictures that you can look at and there's some learning that you can self-teach on that. Remember that the diaphragm has to contract and depress and the external costals have to lift up and out for you to inspire. This produces negative air pressure for you to get air into your lungs and that normally breathing out is a passive process but if you're heaving and you're trying to force ventilate then you're going to pull in the inner internal intercostals as well. I even think that if you're doing forced inspiration, you're probably going to get some pectoralis minor in that action as well. Let's talk about some of the muscles in the spine for just a minute, some of the conventions of how we name them without having to name a lot of different muscles. We say that the muscles, the back muscles closer to the spine are spinalis, lateral to that longissimus, and then most lateral iliocostalis. If we were going to name the erector spinae muscles on the back of the body, we would say the ones closer to the head are called capitus, in the neck, cervicus, and in the mid-back, thoracis, and then, then, then in the low back, lumborum. Let's talk lastly about the eye muscles. I need you to remember a couple of things. Number one, when a muscle sh uh, contracts, it shortens. So if you have a muscle on the outside of your eye called the lateral rectus, when it shortens, you're going to look lateral. If it's on the medial, 
and it shortens, you're going to look medial. If it's superior, you're going to look up. If it's inferior, you're going to look down. It's just that simple with the straight muscles on the eye. Now, something that has always tricked me out, and I've had a difficult time with this, is superior oblique and inferior oblique action on the eye. Here's how I finally conquered it. Superior oblique is on the top, but it does the exact opposite motion. It rotates the eye downward and lateral. The inferior oblique is on the bottom. What does it do? It rotates the eye up and lateral. There is an interesting mnemonic for the eye muscles, SO4, LR6, R3, and it's not gonna mean as much to you now because you haven't studied the cranial nerves, but I want to just kind of discuss it because we need to cross train. We need to get ready for the future. Here's what it means. SO4, LR6, R3, means that the superior oblique muscle in your eye is innervated by cranial nerve four trochlear. LR6 means that the lateral rectus is innervated by the abducens nerve, cranial nerve six. And then all of the rest are innervated by cranial nerve three, oculomotor. None of these words make any sense to you right now, but in a little while they will, because we're gonna talk about the 12 cranial nerves. I probably already have a video on that and how to memorize the 12 cranial nerves. So to review, remember that the superior oblique brings the eye down in lateral. It's innervated by cranial nerve number four, which is trochlear. The inferior oblique takes the eye upward in lateral. It's innervated by the oculomotor nerve number three. Superior rectus, uh, inferior rectus, medial rectus are all innervated by oculomotor number three, and we learned that the lateral rectus is number six abducens. And so, happy studying. Try to relax and just enjoy the journey just a little bit. I know that we're about over halfway through the class, so find something to put a smile on your face and just enjoy the journey. Keep coming back.